委員出席今日司。Welcome members to the Administration of Justice and Legal Services Panel. Uh, meeting. We have a quorum, so I call this meeting to order. Information paper issued since the last meeting. Paper LC paper number CB bracket four five four three five three four slash twenty twelve thirteen bracket one. Uh, information paper provided by the administration on the outcome of the twenty twelve annual review of the financial eligibility limits of legal aid applicants. And the second paper. CB bracket four five five two slash twelve thirteen bracket one letter from Dr. Kenneth Chan dated the eighth of April twenty thirteen proposing to discuss the issue of enactment of archive law and code on access to information and also CB bracket four five seven one slash twelve thirteen bracket one a letter from Mr. Dennis Quag dated. The 16th of April 2013, proposing to discuss the issue of adjustment to the scale rates, English version only. So, items for discussion at the next meeting. Now, would members please refer uh, refer to CB bracket 4571 slash 1213. Bracket O two and O three. The next regular meeting of this panel will be will be scheduled for the twenty eighth of May, twenty thirteen, Tuesday, four thirty p.m. So, I need to ask members whether you agree to discuss the following items. The first one is right of vote issues of children born in Hong Kong to mainland parents, both of whom who are not uh, Hong Kong permanent residents, and also. The handling of sexual offences cases. Um, a suggestion from Dr. Elizabeth Quart. On the 26th of March this year, at the regular meeting, members agreed to invite the Secretary for Justice and the relevant government officials to discuss on the follow-up work by the administration on the right of abode issues of children born in Hong Kong to mainland parents uh, who are not Hong Kong permanent residents. And members have in, uh, suggested inviting the security panel and other electrical members to take part in the discussion of this item. We have uh, talked uh, to the chairman of security panel and other members, and uh, it's agreed that we should, um, or the item should be discussed at the regular meeting to be held on the 28th of May. And we will invite their panel members to take part in the discussion. In relation to item B, as per Dr. Elizabeth Quartz's request to discuss the handling of sexual offences cases by the administration and the judiciary, we will also invite deputations and members of the public to express their views. And if members agree with the following two, uh, with the above two items, we need to extend the next meeting, say to 7 p.m. because. Deputations and members of the public will be invited to speak on the topic as suggested by Dr. Elizabeth Quart. So I hope members would agree with this arrangement. As for other items for discussion, Dr. Kenneth Chen wrote to the panel on the 8th of uh, April suggesting a discussion on the uh, enactment of archive law and the code on access to information, and deputations should also be invited to express their views. And I wish members to note that having discussed with the Secretariat in relation to the archive law all along is within the terms of reference of the uh, panel on constitutional affairs, and it has been discussed by that panel. So I'd like to ask members whether we agree that this panel should discuss the item in the future. So perhaps we can discuss uh, this matter. And Mr. Tam Yu Chong is also here. He is the chairman of the panel on constitutional uh, affairs. And I'd like uh, Dr. Kenneth Chan to address this point, whether we should have a joint panel meeting or should this item be discussed at the CA panel and our members would uh, take part in the discussion there. Dr. Chen. Well, it's very simple. This point was raised at when we 
um, discuss the but or debate on budget in relation to the freedom of information and the enactment of an archive law. And according to the administration's reply, and uh, I think that uh, I actually shared your view that the matter should be discussed at the CA panel. However, according to the administration's reply, the matter has been handed over to the Secretary for Justice, and uh, the Law Reform Commission will look into this matter. So now the ball is in uh, Mr. Rimsky Yun's court, Secretary for Justice. So in relation to the introduction of the law and the policies concerned, I hope that another platform can be created for discussion and so that we can have more constructive discussion and uh, communication with the Secretary for Justice and the Law Reform Commission. We all know that for LRC, their work may take a long time. So I hope that a good, uh, a, plat a very useful platform can be provided for discussion with uh, the administration as well as with the public. Mr. Tam Yuchong, in 2011, this matter was discussed at the CA panel, and it is at the moment on our list of items for discussion. The Law Reform Commission is conducting a study at the moment. We would like to wait for the report of the LRC before we start another round of discussion. I think the work, since the work has been taken up by us, uh, I think um, the CA panel should be in charge of the discussion and we will um, in due course, inform members when this item will be discussed. Dr. Kenneth Chan, do you agree with this arrangement? Thank you. Whilst the chairs of the two panels are discussing this matter, um, I may I make this suggestion? If Mr. Tam Yu Chong, chairman of the CA panel, thinks uh, it's best to, for this item to be discussed by that panel, I'd like to know a timetable. I don't uh, really have in mind which panel to discuss this matter, but uh, a timetable should be provided. Well, if the item is put on the agenda of this panel and if uh, or that panel and Secretary of for Justice then uh, say that is uh, not within his purview, then uh, we won't find a counterpart. All right, I think the matter would be followed up. I don't think the item uh, would not be discussed uh, simply because uh, the uh, it's uh, put on their agenda and the Secretary for Justice uh, will then refuse to attend. And Mr. Tammy Chung and I will definitely follow up on this point. Next matter, Mr. Dennis Kwok on the 16th of April wrote to the panel and proposed to discuss the issue of adjustment to the scale rates. And I'd like to ask members whether this item should be put on the list of outstanding items for discussion. Mr. Dennis Kwok. Madam Chair, as set out very clearly in the letter, at the moment, I understand that the Law Society and the Judiciary will be uh, having a discussion. But of course, our responsibilities include the discussion of this matter because it has to do with uh, administration of justice and legal services. As for the schedule, I, as I said in the letter, uh, it should be discussed in the third or the fourth quarter uh, of this year. So, um, Madam Chair, uh, may it be put on the list of items for discussion? Yes, I agree that it can be put put on the list, and then we can see whether in the future meetings we have time for this item. So, if there are no further objections, I will put this on the list of outstanding items as well. And uh, you may see tabled today is a letter jointly written by Mr. Raymond Wong and Mr. Leung Kwok Hong to this panel. I believe members have already received the letter. Uh, do you need time to read through the letter? I'll give you some time to read it through. Mr. Raymond Wong and Mr. Long Kuo Hong, 
would like to discuss this case at the panel. It's about a case re received by the redress office or the complaints office in relation to the um, conduct of uh, the uh, judicial officer uh, in adjudicating a case, and it's suggested that we discuss this item. So may I ask Mr. Lang Kwok Hong to address this point? Now, it has to do with whether a member of the judiciary has been abiding by the um, laws and rules applicable. The the uh, in that case, um, the mass, uh, the um, the uh, master, uh, Lung Kim Wan was uh, at that time. Uh, refusing to uh, handle an appellant ca appeal case because of other engagements, but at the same time, uh, the uh, master was handling other affairs for um, Justice Ma, and it's very <coughs> contradictory. The judiciary administrator, Mr. Ao Yang, has proved that or confirmed that. As regards Mr. Lee, the administrative assistant to the Chief Justice of the Court of Final Appeal later said that there was no such incident. So whether it's Mr. Lee telling a lie or Mr. Ao Young telling a lie, we don't know. Now, this is something to do with judicial justice. Now, there is this saying that justice should not just be done but be seen. That's a principle under the rule of law. So, Chairman, I'd like you to follow up on this as to what action we should take. Colleagues can give their views. Regrettably, I have not attached uh, the appendix to my letter, so maybe members are at a loss. Mr. Wong Yong Man, Madam Chairman, yesterday we handled a complaints division case. Mr. Lang Kok Hong, Dr. Priscilla Lang, and I handled the case. Members actually received a great deal of information on that case previously. This case involves a very important issue. As a master, did he have the power to handle appeal cases concerning rules governing judges? They're very clear and exact. The guidelines are clear and exact. No word is wrong. Everything has to observe the law. Now, in hand, we have evidence including letters on both sides, which can prove that a judge had mishandled something. For judgments, we can say nothing because there's an appeal mechanism. Even though we're the legislature, we know that for every conflict, he or she will say that the judge was unfair, so we cannot handle judgments. But for this case, there's something special. We can see a loophole there, and in actual fact, there are problems. It is necessary for us to follow up on the case. Now, members only get a letter in hand. The complaints division will handle the case, and we do have other details. We can provide those details to members later. Because the case was only handled yesterday, we can only jointly sign a letter for this meeting. I don't know whether our barrister colleagues have received information about this case. 
After the case was submitted to the complaints division, and letters were submitted to us, as well as replies and letters provided by the complainant in relation to the High Court, we can provide a lot of information. The judicial administrator, Mr. Ao Yang, is actually the superior of the master, Mr. Lung. On two occasions, it said in the replies that Mr. Lung had to assist the Chief Justice. I'm of the view that Mr. Long, the master, should not act in that manner. I've asked the Secretary for Justice, but he said that that's not under his jurisdiction. And then the administrative assistant to the Chief Justice, Mr. Lee, sets in his reply letter very firmly that there was no such incident. Can the Secretariat distribute a set of the relevant papers to every colleague? Some members have raised their hands. I'd like to listen to the views of members. Mr. Dennis Kwok and then Mr. Martin Liao. Mr. Dennis Kwok, thank you, Madam Chairman. If Mr. Long Kwok Hong is commenting on how the judiciary handles complaints against members of the judiciary, then it is worthwhile for this panel to have a discussion. However, if it is about a certain judge's decision, then it is not appropriate to have a discussion in this panel. Otherwise, we'll be acting against a very important principle under the rule of the separation of the three powers. If members, officers, well, in fact, members, officers and the complaints division did receive complaints about judges, is the system sound? Is there room for improvement? Is worthwhile for us to have a discussion and we should have the papers. However, for the decisions of judges, it's not appropriate for us to have a discussion. This is something to do with our judicial system. Mr. Martin Liao, I support Mr. Dennis Kwok's views. After reading the letter and listening to Mr. Long Kwok Hong and Mr. Wong Yong Man, I'm still at a loss. I don't know what's happening. Mr. Long, the master, and the complainant were mentioned. What did Mr. Long do? What did the Chief Justice do? What did the judicial administ judiciary administrator do? What did uh, the administrative assistant of the Chief Justice do? We don't know. I think we need all the relevant information before we have a basis for discussion. Mr. Wang Yongman. Chairman, I don't want to criticize you. We had a thick pile of documents yesterday. The Secretariat should distribute them to members. Unless, Chairman, you don't want us to have a discussion here. Well, this has been our concern for quite some time. We don't mind discussing that later. You see now members are at a loss. If yesterday you could ask that the documents be distributed to members today, members will not be at a loss today. Mr. Tam Yu Chong, well, even if we're given the documents, we may still be at a loss. If the complaint is about a judge, then this panel should not hold a discussion. Chairman, I have to remind you that we have quite a long agenda today and we've invited dozens of deputations to come. We have to start. We should have started at 4.35 p.m. to listen to the deputations. So please handle this as quickly as possible. We well, ask that this be discussed at the next meeting. 
I agree with some members just now that this be discussed at the next meeting. Let's have all the papers first. Don't waste our time. Well, let me make a decision first. Concerning this case, we I participated in the case conference yesterday. According to this letter from the two members, well, you're now saying that I should have distributed the papers to this panel. There are quite a number of papers. Number one, I have identified a time slot at our June meeting when we discuss judicial resources. We can have a discussion on the judicial system. As far as the case is concerned, a case conference was called by the complaints division. From now till that particular meeting, I can distribute the papers to members. Mr. Wong Yok Man is of the opinion that the papers should be distributed to members. Well, my practice is you should tell me your request. Now, that bundle of papers came from the case conference that I attended. Should I distribute the documents to members? It depends on members' requests. So much for this discussion. Let's now proceed to the provision of mediation services in Hong Kong. May I refer you to paper 571 bracket 04, updated background brief on development of mediation services provided by the Electrical Secretariat. It's the latest paper we have. And then we'll also have paper 321 bracket 05, the administration's paper on mediation. We'll first of all invite the representative of the Secretary for Justice and the 37 deputations invited to enter the conference room. On behalf of the panel on administrative uh, administration of justice and legal services, I'd like to welcome the deputations and government representatives. If nest if you so need, you can wear your earpiece and choose the relevant channel. Channel 0, floor. Channel 1, Cantonese. Channel 3, English. 
I will now invite the deputations to speak one by one. Three minutes per deputation. When you speak, you only need to highlight the salient points in your written submission, if any. You don't need to repeat the content of your submissions. In accordance with our usual practice, your submissions have already been uploaded to the electrical web page and distributed to members. If deputations have written supplementary submissions, they are welcome to submit them to us after the meeting. I'd like to remind you that you are not protected by the Electrical Powers and Privileges Ordinance. And when you speak, please do not use cocktail language. Otherwise, you may inconvenience simultaneous interpretation. I'd now like uh, to call upon the Hong Kong Mediation and Arbitration Center to speak. Thank you very much. We're very pleased to attend this meeting. Our center is one of the major providers of mediation and arbitration services. We're established formally after the ordinance was enacted. Our members are from professional bodies, including legal the legal profession, the welfare protection, and so forth. We've focused on public education so that mediation and arbitration have their professionalism enhanced. We've been dedicated to that task. For the sake of this meeting, we've uh, sent in a written submission. Due to time constraints, we may not be able to repeat all the contents in the submission, but there are three major points. The first point is when in, um, international mediation services is necessary in Hong Kong, and if uh, foreign assets are involved or if uh, disputes happen happened in other places are involved, is there any help for mediators? Uh, to draft uh, the agreements or settlements so that it can be enforceable overseas. According to our center's study, in other jurisdictions, for example, in U.S., in South Korea, or in Sweden, uh, there is uh, or there are mechanisms for the mediation settlement agreements be transformed into a form of court order, or the agreement. Uh, can be translated into uh, a, a, an arbitration agreement so that to a certain extent the member states of uh, the New York Convention um, can uh, be um, applicable, but now um, the scope uh, of the law is not clear. And uh, if improvements are made, it can enhance Hong Kong's status as um, and its capabilities in handling mediation. And uh, the other point is how the members of the public and organizations can be assisted in, for example, disciplinary uh, proceedings. Uh, some uh, some communication might have to be disclosed as for how the um, communication or how a permission can be made from the court to obtain uh, such communication for disclosure. Now, according to the guidelines, it's still not very clear. The third point is how this uh, mediation industry can draw reference from other industries like um, healthcare, um, legal uh, profession, and other uh, financial industry, etc., to set up a um, official body, so to speak and uh, to consider whether mediation should be regulated because we need to define what mediation activities is. If we do not give a clear definition and in the future if there is an authority for regulating such activities, it might not be possible. So if mediation activities can be defined as, um, as uh, regulated activities, there might be other difficulties. For example, a conversation between a mediator and uh, his uh, close relatives m might be subject to regulation. Well, in fact, all my comments are in the uh, written submission. Thank you, Mr. So. Next, from Joint Mediation Helpline Office Limited, Mr. Chan Bing Wun. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm from Joint Mediation Helpline Office Limited. 
I'm the chairman. Our office is in High Court Building, 38 Queensway. Uh, we are formed, or uh, our limit, our company is the result of uh, the joint effort of eight um, body professional bodies, and we are supported by the administration. And at a time when our organization was established, there were not many. Uh, mediation service providers. So we were the first company to provide a one-stop mediation service. Our business is getting better and better. The reason is, of course, um, through a hard effort, we have the mediation ordinance, which has taken effect, and we are in the stage of promoting mediation law and mediation services. And we are facing a lot of difficulties in terms of resources and financial resources in promoting mediation. Uh, this is a concern, and I hope that the electrical members could also take note of these problems, because without the necessary uh, resources, including financial resources, we won't be able to do our work. So I hope that in relation to promoting mediation, uh, the Legislative Council can uh, give more concern, and we're doing good business, and uh, we are um, a mediation service provider providing quality service. Uh, uh, one of the concerns is in relation to the quality of mediators in our office. I hope that in the future there could be legislation to protect the general public who are mediation users. That should be appropriate and adequate protection for them. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, third deputation, Mr. Zhao Saiping from DAB. Madam Chair, members, I am convener of the Mediation Group DAB Professional Affairs Committee, and I'd like to uh, give our comments. In relation to the accreditation of mediators, we totally support a quality accreditation body. But I need to remind members that in relation to professionalism, it cannot be set at too high a standard because if it gets too professional, the fees will be set at a level that is unaffordable by the general public. When mediation services are being developed, we are not only talking about uh, court cases, we're talking about community mediation as well. So for a way forward, I think you have to consider public affordability. When mediation becomes a very expensive activity, then something else would uh, have to be formed to substitute mediation. The other point is that on the 17th of April, the HKMAAL gave a talk, and I learned that they are going to implement a registration system for mediators. So for those who have yet to reach the standard, I hope a chance could be given to these mediators to take brush-up courses they should not be totally excluded from the system. The third point I'd like to make uh, is that in relation to the HKMAAL, they now have um, a fixed number of members, and there are four founder members. And may I suggest that uh, it uh, enhances its representativeness and increases the number of members. Because you can see there are a lot of deputations here uh, with many members, so it should enhance its representativeness, which will be conducive to the whole industry. Lastly, about 
development and promotion. I have two suggestions. First, the well mediation is advocated by the secretary uh, for the for the Department of Justice. So the government should take the lead in using mediation services in a number of areas. So the government should take the lead. The other point is community mediation. Right now, the Home Affairs Bureau and Home Affairs Department are the two uh, departments using community mediation. So I hope that uh, our services can be utilized uh, further. Next, Mr. Christopher To from Construction Industry Council. Thank you. Our council supports the administration's paper. Nothing to add. Thank you. Next, Mrs. Catherine Tang Chow Siu Ling from Hong Kong Catholic Marriage Advisory Council. Dr. Priscilla Lang, Madam Chair, members, deputations, good afternoon. I am chair of the Hong Kong Catholic Marriage Advisory Council. I'm also supervisor of marriage mediation and counseling service. I have 19 years of experience in family mediation. Recently, I found that there are a number of domestic tragedies and increasing trend of uh, children hurting their parents. So we should try to uh, our best to rectify the this um a prevailing trend, and uh, I think that uh, the focus has been on commercial or resolving commercial disputes. But I think that family mediation should also be promoted so that the public can be made aware of the service so that uh, family tragedies can be avoided or domestic violence can be provided, uh, can be avoided. In recent years, there have been fewer promotion efforts on TV or newspaper in as far as family mediation is concerned. Rather, uh, I'm seeing more and more mediation in the commercial sector, in the APIs and and, and, and the MTR stations. And uh, in the year 2000, uh, we had a major family mediation campaign, and I hope that the uh, members could think for the interest of the general public and for the harmony of uh, families. So much for me. Thank you. Next, Mr. Ma Siu Lam from KM Lai and Lee Solicitors Notaries. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, the mediation services provided by our firm. Uh, have been uh, set out in the, our written submission, and um, for a way forward, I have three points to make. First is on promotion. I hope media service providers can collaborate with the administration in publicizing the advantages of mediation so that the message can be disseminated to schools and the general public so that um, the public know, knows more about the advantages of mediation. The second point is about the quality of mediators. Appropriate training should be given. The sh training should be enhanced. Uh, criteria should be set, for example, in relation to their professional qualifications, knowledge, skills, and professional knowledge. And uh, maybe introduction, uh, maybe apprenticeship or privilege uh, programs or mentor mentee programs can be introduced, requiring a number of hours to be fulfilled, so that new mediators can uh, acquire experience. Lastly, I support a single accreditation body to take charge of accreditation, training, etc., to ensure the quality of mediators. So much for me. Thank you. Next, Mr. John Butch from Hong Kong Mediation Accreditation Association Limited. Uh, Madam Chairman and Honourable Members, good afternoon. Uh, last week, uh, we had a, a major forum 
uh, to explain the up-to-date developments of Hong Kong Mall. Uh, and uh, I recognize a lot of faces here today uh, that were at that forum. There were more than 70 people present. Uh, and I hope that we gave plenty of opportunity uh, to those present to explain, uh, for us to explain where we were and for them to ask us questions. Uh, as you know, uh, on the basis of various reports, um, th which I've set out in my paper, uh, there is a great deal of support in Hong Kong uh, for a single accreditation body. And we're taking this on a very much a step-by-step -step process. Uh, as you know, we have founder members um, but uh, we have invited other members um, to apply to us to become members of our body and we'll be hearing more about that in due course. Um, I would say that uh, so far out of the founder members as at, uh, this afternoon 250 people have applied to be mediators so it's a great start and we've only been in being for three weeks open for business so uh, it's a good start uh, and we of course uh, expect many more people to apply uh, to be members of our body. Um, I think uh, it, my paper is self-explanatory as to the factors to be taken into consideration in membership uh, of the body and it's set out in full on pages 12 and 13 of the slides. Uh, we intend to be a very inclusive body but we do uh, we are a standards body and it's important that the standards are kept up. It's a difficult balancing exercise and there's quite tension between on one hand being inclusive um, but also being exclusive to ensure uh, that we do not let loose in the general public people that are not properly qualified. Um, we have just set up a working group on accreditation standards uh, under the very able chairmanship of Mrs. Robin Howarth, very well known in the are in the mediation community in Hong Kong. Uh, she has quite a task to do to try to m mend together uh, all the various standards that are available in the various accreditation bodies in Hong Kong. But I feel sure that with goodwill we will be able to succeed and we are hoping uh, that we will have her final report uh, ready by the end of June. Um, Madam Chairman, I think I have set up... I have nothing else to add. 好, 咁, 跟住呢, Next, uh, Dr. James Chiu from JC Professional Mediation Practice. Yes, Dr. Chiu. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members. Ever since we introduced the civil justice reform, we would like to know what we can do in future. First of all, about training and accreditation. In recent years, mediation courses and the number of trainees had multiplied in recent years. In order to have a uniform standard, we need a professional body. And that's why we have the Hong Kong Mediation Accreditation Association Limited. And we would like uh, the association to explore how many mediators we need. Otherwise, we'll be repeating the mistakes of the UK. That is, we turn out too many mediators with many of them out of job. And then a course of 40 odd hours. Is it really enough? Do we need to increase the number of training hours? And then there is this question of how much knowledge a mediator needs in order to draft the settlement document. This is something to do with the 40-odd hour training. And then can we have a fellowship status to enhance the professionalism of the profession? For mediators, there's been a great deal of discussion, but for sections for Section 82D of the ordinance, only the interest of adults is considered, not to the interest of the minors and the elders. Well, very soon, many of us will be above 80 years old, and there will be a lot of post-1980 young people. So we need to consider that. As for dedicated insurance for professional 
liability of mediators we only get one insurance company and that insurance company only accepts insurance on time rather than the complaints themselves so that's insufficient we hope the insurance industry will provide more choices and coverage to the profession I suggest a central database be set up to collect data and information for education and research purposes. The particulars of the clients and mediators need not be disclosed. And then in Hong Kong, for free venues for mediation, there are two community centers. Let me cite Leighton Community Center as an example. It's not dedicated for mediation. So we would like to have more venues. And for law schools, I hope that we can have postgrad. We can make mediation a, an essential subject for master's degrees and postgraduate courses for legal students. And we can have joint mediation services as well from the legal profession and the mediation profession. Sorry, Dr. Chu, time's up. I'd like to remind the deputations and individuals that since today we have so many deputations, I would like to invite you to stop at three minutes. The ninth deputation is not here yet. I'll invite the tenth to speak fast. Ms. Angel Ho from Rainbow Cons Consul Consultancy Limited and professional practitioners. Um, being an accredited mediator and practitioner, I would like to share the following points, which already submitted to the Council um, last Thursday. Um, the main point that I would like to raise is about the mediator's roles and responsibility, and how can we be respected and professionally undertaking the duty uh, in our roles. And the first point that I would like to raise is about the ethical issues. Um, I, I, as far as I understand, some of the solicitors um, may have the, may also take up the mediator role. And how can they be um, respectfully um, distinguished so as to make sure um, there should not be any conflicts of interest? And the second point I would like to raise about, as far as we know, the confidentiality is very important as being uh, during the whole mediation pro uh, process. But how can this be, be used um, later for the other legal proceeding? That should be another issue that I would like to raise. The third thing is regarding the general pub public awareness and recognition. Um, as we can refer to the current uh, HIT case, um, the Mediation roads in this case is um, rather small as far as I'm concerned. And how can this be, um, be made more public, know the mediator role and the responsibility, and how can this be, be um, uh, really helped uh, the, the case to be solved in Hong Kong uh, to make uh, the mediation services to be really, really uh, truly implemented uh, in, um, in Hong Kong? And uh, being the, as I told, I'm the accredited mediator and practitioner, uh, I would like to raise my concern, yes, um, even though I got the, um, the credit, uh, accreditation of the FDRC, I mean I got the, the paper passed. However, I didn't have any case referred to, my, to me uh, to do the mediation, so I cannot be qualified as the accredited FDRC uh, mediator. Um, but as far as I understand, after the Lehman Brothers uh, Mini Dawn's case, um, the government is very concerned about the quality of the uh, bankers and also the quality of the finance, uh, the quality uh, of the uh, uh, services uh, provided within the financial services. Uh, um, in this case, um, can uh, can um, I just wonder if there is any possible uh, mediator or uh, I mean, sorry, um, mentor and mentee's uh, pra uh, practicing uh, system to be implemented in that, uh, in such as uh, in such uh, FDRC um, case, so as to make it to be more truly implemented. Next, Ms. 
Anita Mao from Hong Kong Training Professional General Union. Good afternoon, Chairman and Members. I represent the Hong Kong Training Professional General Union. We have professional trainers and accreditators in our union in order to enhance our standard. We are in support of the separation of training and accreditation. That is, accreditators should not be trainers and vice versa. That is uh, to uphold the credibility of the whole system. We are now very much in need of trainers. In 2012, we set up a professional association to make sure that accreditators are up to standard and to monitor the quality of examination and accreditation work. We have to set standards for trainers and accreditators before we can talk about professionalism. We strongly oppose, however, that those with vested interests form a small circle and work behind closed doors because they may come up with standards that do not meet the demands of Hong Kong and the public. Hong Kong government should place resources where they are most suitable. The government should not just support a few associations and bodies, otherwise that will suffocate professionalism of the mediation profession. I hope that this panel can monitor the government in this regard, such that the profession and the community will get the best interest. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Raymond Wu from True Tide and Associates Limited. Good afternoon. Chairman, I'm pleased to see the implementation of the ordinance, which shows that the government is committed to help uh, helping the public in resolving disputes. 1823 is the complaint hotline such that government departments can come into direct contact with the public, receive comments, and provide support. And through the hotline 1823, we have a suitable avenue to expeditiously reflect problems and difficulties to relevant departments and to seek assistance. Members of the support are willing to receive the service of 1823 because the government has credibility, is fair, it has huge resources to provide true assistance to members of the public, and all services are free. It's also a complaint mechanism to make sure that members of the public are treated appropriately when they lodge complaints. Members of the public do not have uh, huge constraints in lodging complaints. Government departments are all committed to handling public complaints. There are com disputes about neighborhood problems, noise, management disputes, etc. Once a case is accepted, it will be taken care of by professionals. I believe government departments have spared no effort in assisting the public in order to suit statutory requirements and administrative arrangements. For example, there has to be a detailed record and issues generated by complaints have caused government departments to be very, very busy. Before the completion of one case, other cases come, and the civil service is ever expanding to rationalize and handle endless complaints. But when compared with public expectations, government services still have a long way to go. For example, the CS1 administration, Mrs. Carrie Lam, undertook to the public to handle leakage problems. 150 days of investigation have been shortened to 20 days. To government departments, this is already a huge speed for the complainants, the government seems to be still acting very slowly. 
So any good solution from the government? Sorry, sorry, time's up. Next, Center for Restoration of Human Relationships, Ms. Christy Pao. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I represent, represent the Center for Restoration of Human Relations. We're a self-financing welfare association. We provided service since 2001 to handle school disputes, for example, disputes between teachers and students, disputes between parents and children. We'll send mediators to handle disputes. In 2003, we were empowered by our U.S. counterpart to use their teaching materials. And over 2,000 persons have been tra trained. Our trainees were from Macau, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Apart from professional training, we also provide mediation services for student peers, for peers among students. The administration can consider that in society, welfare institutions have already been providing relevant mediation services for different service targets. Our association focuses on human relationships. As for pecuniary disputes, they're different from those disputes handled by us. We would like to retain the original accreditation system. Next, uh, Mr. Chang Kwan from the Council of Social Development. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the representative Chang Kwan of the Council of Social Development. Concerning our views on the development of mediation services, we've basically submitted our views to the LegCo. To sum up, uh, we have uh, two points which were actually raised by some deputations just now. First is on promotion of mediation. Now, right now in the community, um, the awareness of mediation services is not sufficient. We have also um, asked uh, people in the community in relation to mediation and uh, the enactment of mediation law and also the introduction of a system of media uh, or accreditation for mediator in time, uh, five years' time. The community seems to be quite ignorant about these matters. So the administration and the LACHCO should consider how uh, promotion can be enhanced. The other point is that we are focusing on um, the local development. But as I understand, the mainland uh, has long been uh, ha using mediation as well. So we should also consider the development of mediation on the mainland and our integration with the mainland. Now, the other point is about participation. It has been uh, raised by other deputations as well. As far as we know, in Hong Kong currently, many organizations or bodies have been providing training for mediators. And some of these participants asked or some uh, some people ask me whether those courses would uh, give uh, would would be recognized and which courses to uh, be, take part in. I cannot answer them at all. So I think apart from training for mediators, there should also be publicity so that the general public uh, understands which mediator to approach. Thank you. Next, Mr. Hammer Choi from the Council of Mediation Development. Madam Chairman, I have the following salient points on mediation services. We're of the view that for Hong Kong's mediation services and relevant legislations, we're now in a crucial crossroads because there's no consensus yet on the development direction of mediation services. That's why deputations of different views today to reflect to LegCo members. Number one, the mediation system in Hong Kong must have long-term healthy development. Therefore, the government must be far-sighted enough 
and adopt a universal approach. Secondly, we're of the view that the future mediation system and mediators of Hong Kong should have non-extreme professionalism. Now, what does that mean? Hong Kong people, those Hong Kong people who would like to become mediators, there must be a mechanism for them to become mediators. Hong Kong has professional lawyers and professional legal services. For many members of the public, due to their financial ability and the high standard of a legal system, they need relevant and suitable mediation services because the legal system may be too high for them. So in future, thresholds must be set so that general members of the public can become mediators. And a mediation system should suit both Hong Kong and the mainland. Why? Economically and on the basis of daily living, Hong Kong and the mainland have frequent exchanges, and very often disputes are related to both sides. Besides, for this universality approach, the mediation system must be broad enough. If a client, an ordinary citizen, wants to choose his mediator, he should have the freedom to do so. We should not set restrictions to restrict certain disputes to be mediated by certain mediators. Besides, the LegCo must not give supreme status to certain bodies, government departments and ge the general public. Sorry, time's up. I, um... Next, <coughs> Mr. Simon Chi Wai Hong from Hong Kong Construction Arbitration Center. Good afternoon. In 1984, mediation was introduced by the Government on Construction Works contract, and the Hong Kong CAC has always been the pioneer. Um, the, the construction industry has been referred to as the forerunner to the current mediation development in Hong Kong because of complexity of construction contracts and subcontracts, practice and operations, etc., etc. And uh, arbitration, if resorted to, will result in uh, overlays uh, uh, extremely high complex transaction costs for settlement. Over the past three decades, mediation has not been widely recognized because of um, the lack of uh, professionalized construction mediators. We are referring to um, specialized mediators for the construction industry and the welfare sector, etc. The judiciary, in practice direction 6.1, 2006, considers construction disputes as specialized disputes, whereby case management is required with the participation of expert witness before better justice can be, can be achieved. The Department of Justice enacted the Hong Kong Mediation Code 2009, which requires mediators to have specialized training and accreditation to the needs of the disputes as its responsibility to the public and the process. We believe that in order to provide satisfactory and quality mediation services for the various sectors, there should be accreditation and training for mediators in order to meet the needs and expectations pertinent to the nature and demand of the dispute. And under this framework, the HKCAC, since establishment, have um, started a study on specialized mediation, and we also have a customized style to call specialized facilitative mediation to provide better mediation service. We have been promoting the practice and benefit of SMF 
across many professional and trade organizations, including professional training and accreditation. We are widely supported. With regard to the provision of mediation services in Hong Kong, in order to provide a sustainable development for mediation to serve its purpose, to provide satisfactory settlement of disputes, we are of the view that uh, pr construction disputes must be continually be taken and provided with specialization, both on mediation practice and mediators' professionalism. We will continue to provide. Um, all right. Next, Dr. Yang Fan from the School of Law of City University of Hong Kong. Thank you, Dr. Lang. I will speak in English now. The University of Hong Kong has been providing professional education, research and training in mediation and dispute resolution since 1991. When the master's degree in arbitration and dispute resolution was first established. Over the past 22 years, CityU's LLM arbitration dispute resolution program has acquired an outstanding reputation both within Hong Kong and internationally. We have educated more than 1,000 students at the master's degree level who have completed the HKIAC Stage 1 requirements and then gone on to fulfill the HKIAC Stage 2 requirements as stipulated by the HKIAC Mediator Accreditation Committee. Each year, at least one-third of our students complete dissertations on topics directly related to mediation. In addition, our postgraduate certificate in laws program, PCLL program, has offered courses with the dispute settlement elements since 1991. In 2008, mediation practice became an independent elective course, and in 2010, it became a core course in our PCLL program. Given our commitment to the provision of education, research, and training in mediation, we welcome and fully support the establishment of the Hong Kong Mao, a single body for accrediting mediators in Hong Kong. We would like to take this opportunity to make two inquiries and put forward two proposals. The first inquiry relates to the accreditation standards and process. Given the diverse interests and needs of the users of mediation services in Hong Kong, we would like clarification as to how the Hong Kong Mao would take account of that diversity when setting and updating its accreditation standards and process. The second inquiry relates to the Hong Kong Mao's role in providing assistance and support in education and academic research in mediation. Recommendation 25 of the Secretary for Justice Working Group on Mediation has not only set out the accreditation function of the Hong Kong Mao, but also stressed the importance of educating the public about the mediators and mediation. We would like information on how the Hong Kong Mao intends to undertake those tasks. We believe that to further enhance the competitiveness of mediation services in Hong Kong, setting a unified accreditation standard is very important, but by no means the only or most important step. Education, academic, research and training in mediation form the backbone of the further development of mediation service in Hong Kong. I will provide the rest of my report in the yeah, thank website. Thank you. Thank you. I need to declare that I'm a colleague of Dr. Yang Fan. We're, we both work um, in the School of Law in the City University of Hong Kong, so I also um, note the comments, uh, her comments on uh, the development of mediation in Hong Kong. Next, Ms. Lee Kun Mei from Methodist Center. Good afternoon. I express our comments uh, on behalf of the Methodist Center, our restorative uh, center Restorative Justice, um, the Mediation Center was set up in 2008. We provide the services to um, the public, including young offenders, victims, and the parents of uh, victims and offenders and their supporters. We also provide professional training for mediators. In relation to victim offender mediation, VOM, in 2003, it was discussed in LegCo, that is, um, 
the element of VOM should be included in the superintendent's uh, discretion scheme, but at that time it was not supported because of uh, the lack of mediation. Uh, there was no way to find out the effect effectiveness. But now, 10 years down the road, we are talking about promotion of mediation services. So our suggestion is uh, that uh, we have been providing victim offender mediation in Hong Kong for more than six years and in 2012 uh, together with uh, the uh, Hong Kong University we conducted a study in relation to young offenders being subject to superintendent's discretion the victims and their parents according to our study all the participants in the study think uh, give positive comment on the promotion of VOM in Hong Kong. They think that the, the service should be provided in Hong Kong. And in fact, the, our service uh, received the support of the Queensland government in Australia, and they have been providing the service for more than 10 years. They also have a very comprehensive teaching kit, and uh, fortunately, we also received their support, and we can use that teaching kit in provide uh, in training uh, mediators in Hong Kong, and our suggestion is that apart from uh, superintendent's uh, discretion to caution the young offenders, the VOM can also be included so that young offenders understand the consequences of their uh, act, and in the process, victims would suffer, and in the and both parties could restore their uh, relationship in the process. We hope that the government could allocate resources to these uh, organizations providing VOM because we're not making any profit. So we hope the panel and the government could fully support um, the us. Next, um, Dr. Raymond Lang from CNL Holdings Limited. Mediation service has been developed for uh, one or two decades already. Uh, in, in the beginning, the public was uh, totally ignorant about this topic, but now it's getting more and more popular because it provides a flexible mean and alternative dispute resolution to court uh, litigation, and the result is also satisfactory. And uh, is also to the satisfaction of uh, both parties. So mediation is becoming more and more popular. Over the past decade, the government has also um, contributed to the development. As a member of the HKMC, and uh, I like to express the following comments. Uh, I think, first of all, the government should enhance the publicity effort so that th uh, there is a wider. Um, awareness in the community of mediation. At present, even government departments don't understand what mediation is. They don't understand the process of mediation. Secondly, I think more training courses should be provided to civil servants so that every civil servant could become a mediator. Social harmony should be promoted and the civil service should take the lead. Thirdly, in relation to the business sector and the private sector, um, the more promotion effort should be made by the government because there are a lot of business disputes and uh, they should be made aware of mediation services. As for regularizing uh, or um, mediation, um, the, the setting up of the HKMAL is a good thing, but uh, the process should be open and transparent and objective and impartial, and there should be um, extensive consultation in order to reach a wide consensus. The cost of mediation will ultimately be transferred to uh, users, so a proper balance should be struck so that more users can make use of mediation to achieve a better result. Thank you. Next, Ms. Uh, Amarantha Yip from Hong Kong Family Welfare Society. 
Good afternoon. I represent the Hong Kong Family Welfare Society at this meeting. We mainly provide mediation services in family disputes. We're also a major NGO providing such a service. We have recognized training and accreditation courses for mediators. We also have live situations for training purposes. We also provide a great deal of mediation education so as to nurture a culture and society for mediation services. Here I'd like to mention our concerns and views about mediation services in Hong Kong. First of all, concerning accreditation of mediators' qualifications, professional mediators have to handle a lot of family disputes involving hostility and so forth. So special skills are involved. And family mediators have to protect the interest of uh, children. So they have huge impact on the disputes. So we would like to have a very stringent accreditation regime for family mediators as to ensure quality. At least we have to follow the International Arbitration Center standard. As for assistance, financial assistance for those who need family mediation services, I'd like to point out that in the main, family mediation services are provided by NGOs. Two such NGOs, including our organization, are providing mediation services to those who cannot afford the professional fees. Take our, prof our organization as an example. We charge $500 per hour for an interview with both sides, $1,000. We also have professional knowledge about legal aid and certain concessions can be offered if there is a need. We provide training to mediators and we also rely on the community chest for subsidies. In order that we can continue to provide services to those who are in need in the long run, we have to do something. At present, it's $220 per hour, $440 for both sides in total, according to the fee structure of the district offices. That's not enough. Next, Mr. Eric Lam from the Hong Kong Institute of Architects. I represent the Hong Kong Institute of Architects and I speak in English. The development on provision of mediation services in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Institute of Architects, in association with Hong Kong Institute of Surveyor and Hong Kong Institute of Construction Manager, promotes the use of mediation in construction with the insertion of mediation clause in its standard form of works contract. Hong Kong Institute of Architects established its list of mediators since 2004 in support of nomination and selection of mediators after the joint accreditation program with Hong Kong Institute of Surveyor in the same year. These mediators on Hong Kong Institute of Architects these are either HKIAC accredited or otherwise, as Hong Kong Institute of Architects may accept on an individual basis. Hong Kong Institute of Architects considers that architects may be one of the most suitable candidates to act as mediators in construction disputes, as architects have the inherent role in administrating building contracts. They are professional training and practice give them in-depth knowledge and insight in construction process, condition of contract, procedures, and parties' position, such that they can effectively facilitate the parties in mediation, which is a form of facilitated negotiation to reach consensus and secure amicable settlement. In successfully and satisfactorily resolving construction disputes, 
we consider that mediator must possess specialized experience both in construction as well as mediation. Hong Kong Institute of Architect has agenda to promote mediation among its fellow members, to use mediation and serve as mediator specialized for the best benefit for the construction industry. We hope to see more right to the point support from the government, relevant departments, and corporate bodies in achieving our agenda in contributing our effort towards promoting a wider use of mediation in the society. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Professor Anna Koo from Faculty of Law of the University of Hong Kong has been active in quality research and teaching that reach an international standard. One of its key research and teaching initiatives is alternative dispute resolution. I would like to highlight the faculty's progress in promoting mediation education in Hong Kong and review its role in the development of local mediation services. Since September 2007, the faculty has incorporated research outcomes in enhancing potential lawyers' understanding of mediation. Law students can elect to pursue an ADR course and or a negotiation course at undergraduate and postgraduate level. As to mediation, LLM students can receive training that satisfies HKIAC Stage 1 mediation accreditation process. PCLL students gain exposure in the mediation component of both commercial and matrimonial dispute resolution. Since September 2011, LLB students may choose an elective on mediation with a view to equipping themselves as effective legal representatives in mediation. The undergraduate course on mediation addresses not only the principles, rationales, and regulation of mediation, but also enables students to prepare contentious cases, clients, and themselves for mediation in light of the revised civil procedures rules and practice direction 31 after the implementation of the civil justice reform. Therefore, recommendation 20 of the working group report is largely met. And the concerns of members of this panel, as stated in paragraph 25 of the updated background brief prepared for this meeting, can be eased accordingly. As of today, all the above courses are optional, except mediation for LLM students specialized in arbitration and dispute resolution. The faculty is open to consider offering common core courses on mediation in light of recommendation 21 of the working group report subject to teaching resources and curriculum restraints. Looking forward, the faculty welcomes opportunity to collaborate with the Hong Kong Mao to formulate standards, as well as with the administration to promote understanding and awareness to the okay, public. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, next is from E.C. Harris. Mr. John Cock, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, E.C. Harris Built Asset Consultancy is a commercial organisation uh, providing mediation-related services to our clients in Hong Kong and internationally. Um, my partners and colleagues include a number of people who are accredited as mediators, both here in, in Hong Kong and overseas, um, as well as technical experts who support mediation, especially relating to construction. Um, as a, a mediation service provider, we support the concept of a single accreditation body to ensure uniform standards of training and accreditation, while avoiding the necessity for practicing mediators to hold multiple accreditations. At the same time, we recognise parties' right to appoint whomever they may choose to mediate their disputes, and therefore we don't believe that they should be restricted only to choosing accredited mediators. 
However, if they do choose an accredited mediator, they should be able to expect a consistent minimum standard. Um, apart from the above, we're, uh, we're happy to leave the submissions to the panel to the various industry and public representative organisations. Okay, thank you. 跟住係香港和解中心嘅陳萬成先生。誒誒，梁志杰嘅。Next, Mr. Jango Chan from Hong Kong Mediation Centre. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and Deputations. I represent the Hong Kong Mediation Centre. We're established in 1999. We have trained since then over 10,000 citizens. 900 of them have become professional mediators. In the past few years, we focused on the training of quality mediators and accreditation of mediators. Besides, in our center, we have set up committees with some committee members committed to district mediation work. We basically have 60 odd members in that committee focusing on mediation services. I'd like to bring up three points. First, in Hong Kong, how much do Hong Kong people understand mediation? In recent years, the Hong Kong government has been promoting mediation services, and members of the public do have a certain degree of knowledge about the service. But in terms of promotion, I believe the government should change its direction slightly. First of all, public knowledge about mediators is not adequate at the moment. I've asked many members of the public when they choose a mediator, they're mainly thinking that a mediator is a lawyer. If you've learned mediation, you know that a mediator is an independent third party in the handling of disputes. There's no provision of advice. A competent mediator can suitably make use of skills learned and professional knowledge will be of practical assistance to the client. Mediators do not pass judgment in handling a dispute. So in our promotion efforts, we have to tell the public what mediators actually are. And then secondly, there's a misunderstanding about mediation. There's misunderstanding. Mediation is to resolve disputes, but not that many members of the public understand the process of mediation, that is, the various procedures involved. So something must be done about education. We may need to show true cases on TV programs, for example. Thank you. Next, Mr. Andrew Chu from the Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, deputations. I'm a mediator as well as a district councillor. I'm the convener of the Community Mediation Task Force of the Democratic Party. When the mediation bill was being discussed, we already formed a special group to examine the mediation culture and various issues related to the bill. We received a lot of complaints in the process. We discovered a lot of misunderstandings amongst members of the public. They think the mediation is good. They are people to help with the settlement. But very often, they ask the mediator to help them make decisions. In society, not that many well, some people or many people know that mediation services can be used to resolve disputes, but then their actual knowledge about mediation is rather vague. And many um, <coughs> business organizations are now promoting mediation. They say that you can become a mediator earning an hourly wage of $3,000 with 
with a secondary education qualification. It's misleading the public. Members of the public would like to resort to uh, mediation for resolving disputes, but once they approach mediators, they find that the mediators might not be up to standard, and in turn, they might not support mediation. And there are some law firms at the moment claiming um, that cases can be referred to mediators, but mediators are in fact uh, um, collaborative partners of law firms. And uh, we heard uh, that, uh, well, uh, it's said that, uh, according to mediators that uh, um, they would receive uh, $5,000 for, you know, the, going through the formalities and then the, the case would be brought to court anyway. So, in relation to mediators, there should be a single accreditation body so that the public would also know. Uh, about the professional qualifications of mediators and that mediators will be subject to um, disciplinary uh, actions. Now, many uh, organizations in the past provided uh, mediation services and that should be a single body to uh, standardize uh, the development of the whole industry. Next, Mr. Liu Yao Le Pong from Hong Kong Society of Accredited Mediators. Madam Chair. Members, fellow deputations, good afternoon. Uh, well, when we talk about mediation, we need to talk about the uh, HKMAL. It has just been established. It's too early to say uh, whether it's um, it can achieve anything. But in relation to the provision of accreditation training and courses, I hope information can be provided as soon as possible. However, there should at least be enhanced communication between uh, HKML and the uh, NGOs to facilitate development. The Secretary for Justice and the Judiciary should step up their effort in promotion and publicity. I accessed the website today and uh, it according to the website, there are different uh, registers of med mediators by uh, kept by different uh, organizations and there is a practice direction, etc. But uh, there is no further uh, detailed introduction on the code of conduct for mediators, etc. So there should be uh, more publicity. It's important because we need to let the public know that um, mediation is widely recognized and the goal uh, for the industry is to set up a single accreditation body. And we need to be careful about the accreditations given by other jurisdictions because they have different standards. For example, uh, in the mainland China, mediators might uh, receive very different training. There is, uh, in general, um, a lack of knowledge by the public in this regard. I think the reason is that there are uh, quite a number of uh, mediation courses and trainings provided by various organizations. They are not professional institutes or professional bodies or academic quality uh, organizations. Some of them are even set up very recently in relation to their standards of training. We are doubtful. So in short, Madam Chair, I think we should let the public know that it's. Uh, we now have the uh, Hong Kong Mall, which is uh, widely, which is uh, recognized as the um, authoritative organization, so as to boost the confidence of the public in mediation. Only by doing that can we achieve the policy objective of uh, promoting mediation as the dispute resolution method. Next. Mr. Vincent Ho from Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors. Our institute supports mediation and we support quality mediation services. As uh, a professional uh, institute in relation to real estate and surveying, in relation to uh, the work of uh, uh, in this regard and the disputes resolution, uh, we 
uh, facing a number of problems, for example, in relation, sh in relation to disputes on water seepage problems, property management, uh, land premium, pro works contracts, etc. All these affect the general public. And our surveyors all along have been playing a very vital role. A few years ago, we established a, a register of mediators for our industry, but unfortunately, in the setting up of uh, Hong Kong Mao, our institute had not received any respect. Without any communication, the uh, Hong Kong Mao was uh, set up as one of the professional bodies in Hong Kong. We uh, once requested uh, uh, joining the Council of Hong Kong Mao um, to uh, participate in the accreditation uh, work of the Council because we want to handle disputes in relation to our surveying industry. But unfortunately, we never received any positive response or even any response at all. For mediators, they should maintain an impartial role in uh, forging in facilitating the forging of consensus. And it is very important that mediators possess professional knowledge in that regard. And uh, we do play a very important role. We support the development. But uh, it is equally important that we take part in the development. So we have a very clear request that is the Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors should be listed as council members of the Hong Kong Mall, and we should be able to take part in the accreditation work. For mediators in uh, who are members of our institute, we are already doing a lot of work. Uh, for example, for um, we we also take part in the joint mediation um, helpline office, and we think that we should be qualified as accredited mediators without any condition. This is important in allowing us to continue to provide mediation service. Specific. Mr. Danny McFadden, please. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. CEDA has uh, 23 years of experience in the uh, mediation field. Uh, to date, we've been uh, asked to train in uh, 38 countries. Um, I just myself returned from Indonesia last week where we conducted our first uh, training um, courses. Um, so it will be no surprise to anyone that we believe that accreditation standards and assessor training are extremely important. Uh, basically, we look forward to working with the DOJ's steering committee, the accreditation committee, and the uh, HKML uh, working group on accreditation in creating uh, what uh, hopefully it will be um, not without its challenges, but certainly um, hopefully the world-class uh, mediation practice standards in Hong Kong, and uh, we would like to offer, and hopefully we can offer, the international experience that I just mentioned to help establish Hong Kong as the center, perhaps, of mediation excellence in uh, Asia. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next. Next. Ms. Wendy Lui from International Institute of Conflict Engagement and Resolution, Hong Kong Shu Yan University. Madam Chair, good afternoon. I'm from um, Shu Yan University. Apart from training and research in mediation, we also provide relevant courses and uh, academic journals and uh, seminars. And I have the following points to raise. First, in relation to practicing uh, lawyers or solicitors and their role, I think that uh, their mediation advocacy should be enhanced. That is um, when mediation is in progress. They should play the role as mediators um, to promote mediation in order to um, 
facilitate mediation. The setting up of the Hong Kong Mall is a good starting point, in particular in resolving international disputes. And in the future, Hong Kong should develop its own mediation code. Uh, for example, we already have a code um, prepared by the Hong Kong IAC as for uh, arbitration first or mediation first. Uh, that should be a proper mechanism. Now, third point, the focus of mediation is on general me mediation, but we should also have specialized mediation services. One is, uh, for example, media uh, family mediation. The mediation service is required to protect um, the underprivileged, and uh, Hong Kong should look at this legislation and see whether adequate protection has been provided. The other sector is about online mediation. That is, uh, for the EU, they already have a mechanism for resolving uh, the online disputes via mediation. And uh, some rules have, uh, are being drafted in relation to uh, disputes ar arising from online activities. Fourthly, we support the work of Hong Kong Mao. We hope that they can um, finalize their work uh, as soon as possible on accreditation for mediators and training for media mediators. For example, for the Education Bureau, they have a qualification framework. We can we can consider whether the framework is applicable to us. Next, Mr. Tang Chi Wang from Hong Kong Institute of Construction Managers. Madam Chair, members, uh, fellow colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I speak on behalf of the Hong Kong Institute of Construction Managers today. Now, in relation to mediation, the government has uh, done a lot of work, and as mentioned by some deputations earlier, uh, the members of the public now understand what mediation is, but they don't really know uh, the um, what's uh, really involved. For example, they may approach solicitors or barristers. In their minds, they might think that uh, if they engage a barrister or a solicitor as a mediator, on the one hand, they can act as a mediator, but on the other hand, they can also provide legal advice. Therefore, the administration should boost its effort in promoting what mediation and mediators are. At the same time, the government should provide more suitable venues for free mediation services, such that mediation services can be provided in appropriate venues. The Leighton Community Centre, Leung Hin Lei Community Centre in Yao Ma Te, and URA premises do provide venues for mediation. But are they suitable? And are the hiring hours convenient to the public? Because advance booking has to be made with these venues, but mediation may be needed very urgently. Similarly, mediation venues can be needed very urgently. The quality of the mediators will also affect public confidence in mediation. So there should be a standard training mechanism and accreditation mechanism for mediations, mediators. Tertiary institutions can consider making mediation an elective or a core subject. And in secondary and primary schools, mediation can be part of liberal studies. That would be helpful to our younger generations. Our institution was established in 1997 with over 1,000 members. We're fully in support of mediation services. We have a mediator's list. We provide free mediation services to the community, particularly for project disputes. From Chinese University of Hong Kong, please. 
Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to comment, uh, and I'm pleased to offer just some uh, brief personal uh, suggestions, recommendations, perhaps. Um, I also, just uh, refer the panel to my earlier uh, written submission. Uh, in that submission, I, I did deal in depth with the work of the universities, and so I'd just like to uh, discuss what I believe are three uh, key areas that do require uh, careful consideration going forward. Uh, so firstly, in my view, there is a need for investment, investment in sust uh, sustained research into the sustainability and the efficiency of existing uh, mediation uh, ex uh, schemes and programs, but also into the potential development of uh, ever newer and more sophisticated schemes, perhaps particularly thinking here uh, in relation to online dispute uh, resolution, online uh, mediation. Equally, I think there's a need for investment, uh, further investment in research into the uh, attitudes and perceptions of local citizens uh, towards both traditional mediation and indeed online mediation. Uh, secondly, I think there is a very clear need uh, to study the potential to widen those existing schemes that are seen to be performing uh, particularly effectively. And uh, thirdly, I, I would suggest there's a need, uh, particularly for the government here, to reflect on the potential advantages of sponsoring, uh, say, the design and the development of a, a dedicated ADR, ODR web platform, uh, such as is being currently developed in the European Union. Here, uh, I think in the region, we're likely to see a significant uplift in the use of both domestic and cross-border mediation services uh, particularly in the coming years, and I believe for, it's important for Hong Kong mediation providers that Hong Kong is in the vanguard of these uh, developments. Thank you. Next, Mr. Long Hing Fong from Hong Kong Mediation Council. Good afternoon, Chairman and Members. I represent the Hong Kong Mediation Council, which is a branch of the International Arbitration Center. We've been providing mediation services in Hong Kong for decades, and we've experienced the various stages of development. We support the development proposals. In terms of accreditation, we have some views. In paragraph 20 of the paper, it is said that the accreditation requirements are reasonable, and Hong Kong Mao will adopt a certain approach, but objectives and training direction are not touched upon too hugely. Now, this is a matter of priority in terms of logic. We now face development and reform for our mediation services. So for accreditation, we must first of all have clear directions and objectives, that is, what professional mediators we need to serve as an impetus. Besides, we just heard about family disputes, financial services disputes, construction disputes, mediation services, and so forth. Since the CJR in 2001, the number of mediation cases has been growing tremendously. So we must set high standards. The standard of mediators directly affect the interest of the clients. We know that Hong Kong is an international city. The quality of mediators must be up to international standard. Given so many years of development, Hong Kong's mediation services have their own and unique features. So in formulating standards and criteria, we of course need international standards, but don't forget that most cases occur in Hong Kong, so we must have a domestic feature. Next, uh, Mr. Robin Egerton from Hong Kong Bar Association. Chairman, the Bar recognizes the importance of maintaining high standards in mediation and the advantages of a single accrediting body. 
in that context, the bar supports the establishment of Hong Kong Mao. Thank you. Okay. 跟住係英國皇家特許測量師學會香港分。Thank you. Next, Mr. Gilbert Kwok from the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors of Hong Kong. Mr. Kwok, oh, he's not here. Next, Mr. Chen Kampoi from Society of Certified Mediators and Negotiators Limited. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. I represent all members of the Society of Certified Mediators and Negotiators Limited. Our society was established in 2005. All along, we were committed to the promotion of community mediation in Canada. We've recognized 100 mediators, and recently we benefited from advertisements that publicize. An hourly rate of three thousand dollars. We benefited. We ran more courses, and we won at nine courses in one week. I cannot say that there's no publicity, but our trainees came with half knowledge only. We of course have expectations. For the Hong Kong Mao. At the same time, I have to say that the birth and recognition of Hong Kong Mao are subject to doubts. I don't know why. If Hong Kong Mao is to set uniform standards. Then, first of all, we have to resolve this issue of recognition. Very often, we introduce practices from the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc. So, which jurisdiction should we model on in the setting of standards? So, Hong Kong Mao. Should keep an open mind and attitude in listening to the views of the profession. Now, after the Hong Kong Mao has done a great deal of work in setting standards and unif unifying standards, then with a long list of mediators, if there's no job at all. Will we suffer from a wastage then? Among our students, many are staff of trade unions. To handle labor disputes and industrial injury cases, these trade union staff members fare better than professional mediators very often. Thank you. Next,、uh, Mr. Dennis Lok, Professional Mediation Consultancy Centre. Good afternoon. On behalf of our centre, I'd like to say that I've been engaged in mediation training for ten years. Apart from organising mediation courses, we also take care of the need of the profession by providing mentor courses and accredited accreditors courses. We also promote Hong Kong-style mediation. We've done a great deal of work in Great China. The standard of mediation has been enhanced a great deal. Last year, we got the ordinance. We've been in support of that. On Hong Kong Mao, I'd like. To air these views for your reference, the merit of Hong Kong Mao is that teacher qualification, training courses, mediation standards can be unified, thus boosting the confidence of users. However, if there's no consensus within the profession, and various interests cannot be 
taken care of, and there's no uniform standard for entry, then there will be a problem. We need flexibility. We don't want to see division within the profession. We don't want to see new platforms formed. Otherwise, social resources may be wasted. Now, if we look at uh, the developments ahead from the viewpoint as a mediator, we need a common ground. We need communication to boost development. So there must be a mechanism for communication. Thank you. Next, Ms. Maureen Chu from Hong Kong Mediation Alliance. Good afternoon, Chairman and members. I'm from the Hong Kong Mediation Alliance. We only have a short history, but we already have over 200 members, all coming from different accreditation bodies. And they're all professionals. They are committed to serving local communities. With the hard work of our members, we've successfully made referrals with a success rate of 60%. We also cited some problems. Take the Labour Tribunal as an example. It seems that the Tribunal only recognizes mediators from a few organizations. I hope you will pay attention to this. Fairness and justice are always mentioned by the government, but it seems that the tribunal's practice is against those principles. For small claims, we very much encourage the parties concerned to make full use of mediation services. So I'd like the government to pay attention to these problems. Thank you, Mr. Kenneth Lau from the Hong Kong Mediation Profession Staff General Union. Good afternoon, Chairman. I represent the Hong Kong Mediation Profession Staff General Union. Our objective is to strive for the interest of our employees. If the interest of our members are affected, we won't support the arrangement. At present, we do not have enough cases. Our members told us that a few years after they were qualified, they had not received any case. The Department of Justice hugely promotes mediation services, but other public bodies do not recognize and support mediation. Just now we heard from the profession that for the general public, they basically know of mediation services. Let me give you an example. For the biggest public organization in Hong Kong, a patient would like to have mediation with a hospital. But the hospital authority said that it would wait to the patient to go to court. So I'd like to ask, under such circumstances, how can we promote mediation? Besides, we now have different mediation bodies for the Labour, for, sorry, for the Lands Tribunal. That's an example. So I'd like to ask the chairman a question. Under such circumstances, how can our employees know what to do? Good. Thank you very much for attending this meeting and expressing your views. I can exercise a discretion to give 15 minutes more to our members and the administration. Perhaps I should first of all invite the Deputy Law Officer, Mr. Simon Lee, to respond to the deputations. Mr. Lee, please. Madam Chair, I've just heard a lot of valuable and pragmatic views, and I have um, 
read through our papers and the submissions, I see that uh, there is general support for mediation. This is quite positive. And I've also heard a lot of supporting voices for the setting up of a single accreditation body. And this is, uh, and I'm glad to know that we will be making effort in this regard. Now, with uh, all these submissions, we need to go back and uh, consider all the views. This is so much uh, for me for the time being, but we will, of course, consider all the views and see how they can be in incorporated uh, in the work of the steering committee. Mr. Lee, I hope you would really uh, consider thoroughly all the views expressed by deputations today. Two members have raised their hands, or oh, three or four members. First, Mr. Dennis Kwok. I need to keep watch of the time, so please uh, be confined to three minutes. Madam Chair, I will try to be as concise as possible. Thank you, deputations, for coming here and express your views to the LegCo today. And some of the deputations uh, spoke on accreditation, and that is the professional qualifications of a mediator. Maybe I will invite Mr. John Butch. Uh, because you're representing Hong Kong Mao, and you, your organization is uh, quite uh, new, and this is uh, your focus. And Mr. Butch, perhaps you could say more on that. Madam Chairman, uh, thank you, Mr. Kwok. Um, I've also heard uh, a lot of uh, very supportive views for a single accreditation body today. Uh, I've also heard uh, some comments and criticisms. Um, I, like Mr. Lee, um, have made uh, copious notes, uh, and I would like to go back. I have a meeting of my council tomorrow morning, uh, and I will be giving these views to them, uh, and we will, of course, uh, take due note. Um, we have uh, just started on this journey. Um, it's quite a job to do. Uh, there are very few countries in the world that ever have uh, an overarching accreditation body, and uh, bearing in mind uh, the various uh, comments today. I can understand why uh, quite a lot of countries have given up, but uh, we are determined uh, and we will carry on uh, because there is such a, an overwhelming view, uh, I'm not saying unanimous, uh, that uh, in Hong Kong uh, it's a relatively small uh, condensed place uh, that we can have with goodwill from many parties an overarching standard uh, which can only be for the benefit uh, of Hong Kong uh, and for the public. Thank you. Mr. Tan Kapil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today I have heard a very diverse views. Single accreditation body and a recognized body. I don't think this is uh, beyond any doubt. Now, uh, but there are um, questions on uh, which body to become the single accreditation body. Some organizations have been, uh, set up a long time, some are new organizations, and some are professional bodies. And the Hong Kong Mall and the administration have heard all the views, and I hope they can uh, be uh, inclusive. First, on promoting mediation, and second, on uh, publicizing mediation and promoting mediation to the general public. If there are only two or three bodies involved, it might give an impression that it's getting more and more uh, professional. Uh, but according to uh, some deputations just now, the general public might feel that only lawyers should be qualified as good mediators. But this is not the ultimate result that we want to achieve because this will incur high costs in mediation. So coming back to the question, if there are already views uh, or criticisms on Hong Kong Mao, then uh, would there be um, a problem in terms of the imbalance? I hope the administration could uh, pay heed to this point because mediation is necessary necessary not only to major works contracts but to um, other non-pecuniary uh, problems. I hope the Secretary 
for justice could follow up on this point. For example, some NGOs have been providing mediation services. Should they be included or should they be excluded? Now, the other point is that at the moment, the Hong Kong Mall is uh, set up with the support of the government. The question is whether in the future it will become a statutory body with funding from the government. And will cases be referred to this uh, statutory body in the future? My understanding is that uh, this is a comment. So next, Mr. Chung Kwok Pan. Thank you, deputations, for attending the meeting and expressing your views. The administration is promoting mediation services. We have APIs on TVs and comparing to other, uh, I mean, comparing to litigation, mediation offers a cheaper alternative. But according to uh, many deputations who have spoken just now, there are universities. Uh, uh, locally providing mediation courses, but they are quite um, diverse, and there is a lack of uh, standardization. The Hong Kong Mao, accordingly, is um, becoming the so-called a focal point. But in fact, as I understand, mediation involves commercial disputes, family disputes to more specialized disputes like land um, disputes. It covers such a wide scope, and I hope the administration could consider how these uh, various sectors could be consolidated. And uh, the Hong Kong Mao originally involves four founder members. But like I said just now, it covers a very wide scope. Mediation itself covers a very wide scope. So can other um, specialized organizations or professional bodies be included as members? This should also be considered. The administration and Hong Kong Mao has just uh, said that they would go back and consider all the information. I'd like the administration to give me a timetable. I'll invite the administration to reply in one go. Next, Ms. Alice Mack. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, close to 40 deputations who have come and spoken today. By the number of deputations, we can see this is a concern shared by all, and uh, uh, this is quite controversial. As I was uh, listening to the views, in fact, I think there aren't many questions on the setting up of a single accreditation body. The question is on how the mechanism is to be set up and the future relationship with the Department of Justice. I think the administration should explain about this. It may not be a bad thing that we raise questions now, but at least you should answer these questions. Why only four members are involved? And how can you ensure that the accreditation standards set out in the future can, like deputations have um, spoken on this point, be tailored to the needs of Hong Kong. We agree to this body because we hope that the the mediators can be specialized. But if mediators become too professional uh, as an occupation, it may not be a good thing for the general public. The general public would like to pay um, at a reasonable price for reasonable service. Otherwise, it could just resort to lawyers. They don't need to go through all the fuss. So I think the Department of Justice f should explain why only four founder members are involved and what is the future relationship between the DOJ and uh, this body, and also how the accreditation standards could tailor um, for the needs of uh, Hong Kong. All right, the administration can reply in one go. We have um, Mr. Lang Kuo Hong next. I'm sorry, I uh, had to uh, attend the uh, development panels meeting next door. 
I think the question about mediation is that when I dealt with complaints in the past, it's just like arbitration. If you do not accept arbitration, uh, the case would need to be educated by the judge, and the judge would be upset. Mediation itself, it's a good thing. It can shorten the um, process or even do away with the unnecessary legal process so that a reasonable outcome could be achieved that is acceptable by both parties. The problem is that the Hong Kong Mediation Accreditation Association Limited has been established, and the question is whether the four founder members of Hong Kong Mao could understand the woes of ordinary people. That is, if you do not take the route of mediation, then in um, future, during the stage of litigation, the judge might uh, think that uh, you are unwise in not taking mediation. And a more detailed explanation should be given to prospect, um, prospective users and other stakeholders as to whether more members can be included other than the founder members of Hong Kong Mao. I think there is a question here. Of course, in the initial stage, only few would be founders. But now we have reached a stage when our whole system will be refined and improved. I think there should be the um, I think more stakeholders should participate in the process. All right. I also have some questions to follow up on the points. I think mediation over the past few years has received great support because after, say, the Lehman Brothers saga, we know that um, it is difficult for the general public to uh, seek justice because of the lengthy and complex legal process. In relation to family, uh, domestic affairs and construction industry, we have more experience in mediation. And there are more successful cases in these sectors in which we see the participation of, say, engineers, uh, social workers, psychologists, other than uh, just legal professional, legal professionals. So, since the last term, we have uh, been striving to promote mediation in the community. However, we have also heard views from deputations just now uh, that many experienced. Uh, mediation service providers like your local universities and other organizations have been providing service before the setting up of uh, Hong Kong Mao and the passing of the law, and their concern is uh, on the inclusiveness and representativeness of Hong Kong Mao and on promotion and publicity uh, of mediation and the experience of Hong Kong Mao in this regard. Now, on the last occasion, um, during the enactment of subsidiary legislation, some members raised a question, just like Chinese medical practitioners in the past. After passing of the legislation, many existing practitioners felt that they uh, have not been given the opportunity to take part in the area of work. Now, many deputations have also expressed the same viewpoint. I have also taken part in um, arbitration. I'm also an arbitrator with CETA, and I'm also a member of the Hong Kong Bar Association. And I don't 
think mediation should be led by the legal profession. So, very sincerely, on behalf of uh, Mr. Lee, you act on behalf of the Department of Justice, and Mr. John Butch from Hong Kong Mao. I hope that you could uh, give a very brief response, having heard all the views expressed by the deputations. And I hope the Department of Justice can give us a written response on the views heard today. So over to you, Mr. Lee and Mr. John Butch. Mr. John Butch, please. Chairman, thank you, honourable members. Uh, I just want to make uh, one thing very clear. Uh, we had to start this journey somewhere, so we started with four founder members. Um, we do not intend uh, this to stop with just four founder members. Um, just before Easter, we invited uh, nine bodies uh, to be members. Uh, I'll not embarrass them by n mentioning their names, but uh, they're, certainly some of them are, are here today. And uh, I know that the Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors have already said in their submission that, that they're one of the members. I'm meeting uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Surveyors um, and the architects at the end of this week. Um, I met many people last week um, at the forum, and uh, we have set out very clearly in our slides the factors that we will take into account in considering membership. The membership of this body, you've got to remember, it's a regulatory and disciplinary body. It's not to be a membership body per se, because if we allow it to be a membership body, we'll be in the same position as many professional bodies who are in a conflict of interest situation because they're both a trade union and a regulatory body. We do not want that. We want eventually to apply to this uh, Honourable Council uh, for statutory authority. So we believe that our journey uh, will not end, but it will move on into a statutory body, hopefully in due course. I believe that, um, that the four founder members are not just uh, lawyers. Yes, I accept that I'm a lawyer, but I, I represent the Hong Kong Inter International Arbitration Centre. And both the Hong Kong Mediation Centre and the HKIC uh, have got many, many people from different walks of life. Many of the people that you mentioned, Madam Chairman, people like psychologists, human resources people, engineers, surveyors, engineers, I could go on. There are many people from very many uh, professions already represented in the four founder members. So it's not just a legal um, body. It's got many other parts to it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Chairman, of course, will take follow-up action. After the establishment of the Steering Committee on Mediation, we've embraced members from many sectors of the community. We'll monitor the Hong Kong Mao in his work, including his work in setting standards. Mr. John Barch explained, and last week when he met with other stakeholders, he also mentioned that they had formed a working group with members from different organizations and with different background. So there are not just lawyers. I believe we'll be able to meet your expectations and concerns, including those concerns raised today. Another issue is timetable. We would like to adopt a step-by-step -step approach. Just now we heard that the Hong Kong Mao aims to produce a working report in June this year. So we'd like to report on our work as well, including regulation of mediation services. That's also very important. In our steering committee, we're considering various forms of publicity and promotion, and views expressed just now will also be taken on board. After the discussion in the steering committee, we would like to come up with a timetable which will be explained to this panel. So, Chairman, rest assured that we'll continuously report back to you. Yes, so you continuously follow up on mediation services. I wish them success. Just now, there's this concern about 
excessive supply of mediators. Please include that issue in your review, and please pass your review report to this panel. So thank you very much for spending so much time with us to share with us your experience in mediation. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to appeal to members to stay in the conference room because we are proceeding to a related subject, promotion of Hong Kong as a regional legal and, ab and arbitration services hub. If possible, please stay on for a moment. I've exercised my discretion in adding 15 minutes to our meeting so that the S4J and other members can follow up on the issue. It's paper 571, bracket 16. Let me invite the representative of the S4J, Mr. Poon, to enter the conference room as soon as possible. Again, I'd like to thank the deputations. Our meeting is still in progress. Well, let me invite Mr. Frank Poon, the Solicitor General, and Mr. Robin Egerton to attend the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance. <coughs> Yes, you can start. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to thank the panel for according us this opportunity to introduce our work in promoting Hong Kong as a regional legal and arbitration services and hub. I'd report on our work and policy. We've submitted a paper, 571 bracket 16, to you. In the paper, we've detailed our policy in this regard and methods of policy implementation. Let me highlight three aspects of our work. First of all, by this regulatory framework for legal services, we would like to foster our policy for solicitor advocates Limited liability partnership, limited liability partnerships and solicitor corporations. We would like to promote Hong Kong into an even more convenient regional legal and arbitration services center, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, with two directions. We've all along worked hard to perfect Hong Kong's legal framework for arbitration services. In 2010, we implemented, we enacted the brand new arbitration ordinance. And tomorrow, the arbitration ordinance will be read for the first time. That means the S4J is dedicated to perfecting our arbitration laws. Besides, we would like to introduce world-class arbitration agencies and related legal bodies such that they will establish their regional offices in Hong Kong to develop their business. Hong Kong has its own international arbitration center. We support their work. Last year, they, were ex they expanded the arbitration venue. And then I'd like to say something about the International Chamber of Arbitration, 
which started their work in 2008. Hong Kong is their first branch outside Paris. They've chosen Hong Kong as their Asia Pacific office. This shows their confidence in Hong Kong. That's the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce. Earlier on the mainland, we got the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, which recently opened a, pran a branch in Hong Kong. The S4J did support that effort. And then I'd like to mention the world-renowned The Hague Conference, which also set up a branch in Hong Kong last year. The S4J very much support them. We would like to match their effort in developing their Asia-Pacific business. And then through the mainland, we would like to further promote the arbitration services of Hong Kong. In recent years, we've done a great deal of work on the mainland to promote Hong Kong's arbitration services, including those in Shanghai and Guangzhou. Very soon, in Xiamen, we'll have a forum to introduce Hong Kong's legal and arbitration services. Now, all these our efforts to enhance Hong Kong's status as an international arbitration center. center. We're not just doing this on the mainland. In overseas jurisdictions, we also promote Hong Kong's legal and arbitration services. In particular, we'd like to assist Hong Kong's professional bodies. Earlier this year, we went to India to stage a road show to introduce Hong Kong's merits as a provider of legal and arbitration services. In future, if there are suitable forums and seminars, the S4J will try its very best to participate, to introduce our services. For example, in the paper, Vietnam and Burma are jurisdictions where we'll promote Hong Kong's legal and arbitration services. Apart from these three aspects, we keep in contact with various stakeholders. In the promotion of Hong Kong's legal services, we particularly have a great deal of collaboration with the Bar Association and the Law Society, both in Hong Kong and on the mainland. And I also mentioned the International Arbitration Center and international bodies. like the Hong Kong IAC, ICC, ICA, Asia office, and so forth. So much for my presentation for the moment. My colleagues and I will be happy to answer members' questions and listen to members' views. Members, any questions? Well, let's invite Mr. Egerton to speak also. Yeah. Bar uh, recognizes uh, with admiration the work done by the administration in promoting arbitration. Um, Mr. Egerton, may you talk to us the microphone? Yeah. I apologize. Okay. The, the Bar recognizes with admiration the work done by the administration in promoting arbitration. Uh, one aspect that the administration might wish to consider is the use of arbitration in ancillary disputes in divorce, that is, financial disputes. That's an area that is developing uh, in other jurisdictions and sometimes relieves judicial resources, enabling parties to resolve their disputes uh, privately. Okay. Um, and All right, Mr. Jay. All right, Mr. Chong, followed by Mr. Dennis Kwok. Three minutes each, all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just now, the administration mentioned that uh, other international arbitration organizations would be should be attracted to come to Hong Kong. But I'm asking, what are the edges? What advantages do we have?
But Hong Kong is such a small place, and people are usually um, aiming at the uh, mainland market, which is much larger. But the legal system on the mainland is totally different from our legal system. So, do we have any advantages to uh, attract international organizations to come to Hong Kong? Mr. Poon. Thank you, member, for your question. This is exactly why we need to promote Hong Kong as the regional arbitration center. Now, in relation to the rule of law and our legal system in the uh, Asian Pacific region, we are um, ranking the top. Well, be it the quality of legal professionals and judges and arbitrators, we are in the lead compared to other places in the Asia Pacific region. So this is um, our advantage, and for other jurisdictions in Asia, the legal framework for arbitration in Hong Kong is actually quite good. In particular. Uh, not long ago, we passed a new arbitration ordinance, and uh, according to a lot of views, we are in a quite advanced position. So, be it legal professionals or the legal framework itself, we are enjoying advantages. The third point is that in enforcing the um, outcome of arbitration, we also enjoy advantages. We are members. Uh, we are a member of the New York Convention, and we also have uh, made effort in relation to uh, enforcing the uh, arbitration reward in other countries. For example, in India, last year we were able to resolve the dispute, and tomorrow. We're going to table the arbitration amendment bill uh, to the council, and we already have a mutual recognition mechanism with Macau. And uh, tomorrow, this amendment bill will be tabled in the council for implementation of this arrangement. And we hope that in the coming few years, we can focus on. Enhancing our network uh, with the mainland, including uh, Taiwan, so that the outcome of arbitration is enforceable either in Hong Kong or in Taiwan. Uh, the next point is about mainland. It's very important because Hong Kong um, is regarded as a gate to the mainland market. Uh, many foreign investors would like to invest in the mainland, or uh, be it uh, state-owned enterprises or private enterprises in the mainland. If they want to um, make outward investments, they could make use of our service as a means of dispute resolution. For example, when they have disputes with foreign investors, they might want to choose Hong Kong as the third party or the place where arbitration can be carried out in order to resolve disputes. So we do enjoy advantages. Next, Mr. Dennis Kwok. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to follow up on Mr. Chung Kwok Pan's question. I think he asked this question because, well, of course, we understand that we have a good legal system in Hong Kong. We have a uh, judicial independence. We also have a very sound legal system, and these are our advantages. But how do we actually, policy-wise, attract organizations or enterprises, in particular on the mainland, to come to Kong Hong Kong? Uh, in order to utilize our legal services, are there any incentives for them to embrace our legal system or our common law system? I don't know whether the Department of Justice has any 
new ideas apart from arbitration. Now, um, the uh, Mr. Poon explained quite clearly about that. Apart from arbitration, are there any new developments? Any ideas, Mr. Poon? As mentioned before, um, we have a good legal system, and this is our advantage. And um, this contributes very much to an uh, 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 an incentive to attracting enterprises to uh, uh, in other countries to utilize our arbitration services. Apart from that. In other areas, we'd also like to encourage more foreign investors uh, who'd like to invest in mainland or uh, state-owned enterprises or private enterprises in the mainland to use our service. For example, uh, Tianhai Development and Nansha, we have a pilot and early implementation scheme so that more Freedom could be given to state uh, to to uh, to mainland enterprises to use Hong Kong services. We know that on the mainland there are cases in which enterprises might not have the freedom of choosing a place other than the mainland to have arbitration. So Tianhai and Nansha. Are the two places for the pilot scheme, with more relaxed uh, regulations. We hope that uh, they would choose Hong Kong as the place for arbitration. There are difficulties because uh, the uh, mainland's policies are involved, but we are still striving for the implementation in Tianhai and Nansha. And uh, this will also help Hong Kong in uh, enhance and in bolstering its status as the uh, regional arbitration center. And we also encourage the use of arbitration as a means of alternative dispute resolution. In the case of disputes between Hong Kong enterprises and mainland enterprises, Hong Kong can be the base of arbitration. And uh, also, several years ago, we already implemented an arrangement with the mainland authorities in enforcing court uh, arbitration orders. We hope that by doing so, we could attract more foreign investors whilst having business transactions with the mainland to make use of Hong Kong courts to resolve their disputes. On the other hand, there is also a mechanism for the mutual enforcement of court arbitration orders on either side, and we hope that by giving I hope that uh, they could make use of Hong Kong services. This will also help our profession's development. In the coming years, we will closely monitor the arrangement as to how this can be implemented in Hong Kong and the mainland. Thank you, Mr. Poon. Next, Mr. Michael Tien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you provide some statistics? In 2011, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center dealt with uh, some cases, and 66% of uh, cases are international cases. That's uh, 188 uh, international cases. Now, you say that more um, parties will be attracted to have international arbitration in Hong Kong. But do you have any statistics? I don't have a legal background. So if you succeed in attracting more parties to carry out international arbitration in Hong Kong, how 
does Hong Kong benefit from it? Do you have any data or statistics for sharing? Mr. Poon, thank you, member, for your question. Now, it has to do with uh, arbitra number of uh, arbitration cases. We are looking at the uh, statistics provided by the HKIAC to us. Every year, they do publish uh, any report. So according to their figures, the uh, number of cases has remained stable throughout the years. Apart from HAIAC as the arbitration body, we also have ad hoc arbitration cases uh, and bodies. Well, this is arranged on a temporary basis by uh, the parties to the arbitration, so we do not have the data. Cases will still be growing. Why? As I mentioned just now, the China institution has already set up, that is, the CIETAC has already set up their branch in Hong Kong. As the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission operates longer in Hong Kong, we would expect more cases. As they have set up their branch in Hong Kong, more clients will choose to have arbitration in Hong Kong. So optimistically, in the coming few years, we should see an increase in the number of cases. Now, how will these arbitration cases help us? We, it's very difficult for us to say if we have how many cases, how much more money will go into the pockets of our people. But I'd like to say that apart from the arbitration profession, other trades and industries will benefit. We have the mediators, we have lawyers, witnesses may have to come from overseas jurisdictions to testify. They have to patronize the hotels and eateries in Hong Kong. They also need professional translators and interpreters, etc., etc. So all these will benefit Hong Kong's economy. We cannot say with specific figures how helpful to Hong Kong's economy will arbitration services be. But given the number of people in the profession and with the expected increase, how much more Hong Kong's economy will benefit? Well, we have to understand that arbitration is something international. It's not just lawyers and mediators who participate in the process. Say if a client in drawing up contracts, stipulates Hong Kong as the arbitration venue, then a lot of international professionals may come to Hong Kong. Many solicitors firms in Hong Kong have their own professionals and experts. I don't have the exact figures, but I can say that Lawyer, uh, solicitors plus barristers plus registered foreign lawyers form a team of about 10,000 people. And many of them may participate in the provision of mediation services. So it's very difficult to produce exact figures. Thank you. Perhaps 
uh, I can provide you with some supplementary information. I'm also an arbitrator with uh, ICCICA, oh, sorry, with uh, CIETAC. Even on the mainland, they very often choose arbitration, although the parties concerned may want to remain anonymous. Many clients don't want to go to court. In recent years, our mainland counterparts have been moving abroad. In particular, if they are considering major developments in Hong Kong, very often they'll opt for jurisdiction in the resolution of disputes. In particular, for the big firms, they don't want people to know that they're involved in financial disputes. Well, I heard from Mr. Poon that they open a number of offices on the mainland and the CIETAC has also set up a branch in Hong Kong. Now, this is to facilitate international trade. Well, a great deal of mainland investment have come to Hong Kong. Many of them will opt for arbitration in dispute resolution. Arbitration is attractive in Hong Kong. They are confident in Hong Kong's courts, in particular for economic and trade arbitration. Hong Kong is a good choice. So mainland investment is also very important on the mainland. They very often resort to arbitration in the resolution of economic and trade disputes involving an overseas partner. In particular, in Shanghai, I'd like you to promote uh, arbitration and mediation services. Just now, we had a long session on mediation services. So there must be a balanced development for mediation services and arbitration services. And we're facing very good opportunities at the moment. I'd like the S4J to work harder in terms of promotion and publicity. So thank you very much, members, for your perseverance. And I'd like to thank the S4J for doing such a good presentation for us. Tomorrow, we have a motion and an amendment. So tomorrow, there'll be another forum in Lechco for the discussion of arbitration. Thank you.